So my name is Letitia James, but everyone refers to me as Tish. Please call me Tish. Um, we're the first digital generation in history, uh, suddenly connected in ways that past generations could never have imagined. Um, but as uh, President Obama once said, if we're going to be connected, then we need to be protected. Um, and we were just reminded by that uh, by Representative Welch. Um, and we want to thank him for that. And we want to, again, thank him for recognizing that we are the custodians of the rule of law. Um, and it's all really critically important that all of us understand that no one is above the law um, and that we have stood together to save and to protect our democracy. And that really is our role as we go forward. I want to thank the National Association of Attorneys General for all that you do. I want to thank um, T.J. Donovan, the Attorney General of Vermont, for this wonderful conference. Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> and I know he's not in this room, but tell him it was an honor and a privilege to meet his lovely bride, Jessica, yesterday at the reception. And of course, to my very good friends, A.G. Camacho and A.G. Racine, thank you for being here as well. Thank you. This week, we've watched uh, CNN and MSNBC and all of the television shows on the hearings on Capitol Hill about privacy and security and social media. And we've heard a lot um, at this conference uh, over these last two days with respect to privacy and data collection and, of course, of social impacts. Um, and for all the tech representatives in this room, I want you to know that I think um, being connected is more positive, um, has its positives, um, and we have immediate access to information. We can stay in touch with our loved ones. Um, during the pandemic, obviously, social media, we all relied upon it. And so big tech has a role to play in our society. We recognize that. But we also know that there are issues and there are concerns. And there's evidence that some big tech companies use their wealth and their information to stifle competition. And at times, they use behavioral advertising models, uh, which is terrible for our personal privacy. It rewards them for collecting as much information on individuals as they can. We talked about AI a few uh, yesterday. We talked about my experience. Um, and so as attorney generals, we, business and tech leaders, we need to work together. Let me say that again. We need to work together. Public-private partnerships. We need to have discussions and try to resolve some of the issues that our society is facing. I'm proud that uh, attorneys general have taken on these issues across party and lines and uh, across regions. And I want to thank the 48 of my fellow AGs who, um, uh, for joining with my office in our shared antitrust lawsuit against Facebook, and for all of us who are part of the two similar lawsuits against Google. Our antitrust laws were created specifically to prevent monopolies uh, from using their power to harm competition and consumers. And when it comes to privacy, we need uh, better laws that we can enforce to protect consumers because most current laws focus on requiring companies to disclose their data collection and give consumers the ability to opt out. I want to see laws that provide clear limitations on data collection and what companies can do with that data. Let's be honest, um, our laws, unfortunately, have not kept pace with current society, and we need to change that. So I am going to introduce members of our panel allow them to say a few words to you, and then pose some questions to them, and then open it up to the audience. Our first panelist is Pam Dixon. Ms. Dixon, are you in the room? Okay. Yes, I am, and I'll bring up my video right now. Okay. Oh, you should be seeing me. Okay. So. <laughs> So let me just give them a proper int introduction, if you don't mind. Would you like to have a seat? You could have a seat, sure. First, Ms. Pam Dixon is the founder and the executive director of the World Privacy Forum, a respected public interest research group. 
um, an author and researcher. She has written influential studies on privacy and identity, biometrics, AI, health, and complex data uh, ecosystems and their governance. Um, Tom Galvin, thank you so much for being here. Um, he is the director of Digital Citizens Alliance. Uh, Mr. Galvin has been active in internet security and safety issues for over a decade. As executive director of Digital Citizens, Tom is focused on bringing a voice to consumers, including those who have been victimized online by putting a face on the victims of online crime. Digital Citizens will serve our fellow citizens and issue a wake-up call to policymakers and internet companies that must do more to protect us. Is Tim Sparacini here? Spar Sparapani, the founder of SPQR Strategies. Is he online? I am. I'm, I'm here, General. Thank you so much. Okay. Tim is a legislative, legal, and strategic consultant who helps companies and consumers, consumer and privacy advocates understand and respond to the pressures created for businesses, consumers, and governments by emerging technologies. Tim's specialties are privacy, cybersecurity, technology, antitrust, and constitutional law. And prior to joining Facebook, Tim was senior legislative counsel at the ACLU, where he helped advance the constitutional principle of the right to privacy, representing the ACLU before Congress, the executive branch, and the media. Jennifer Urban, are you on? I am. Oh, she I is on. Coming up in a moment. <laughs> Jennifer is a clinical professor of law at the University of California, Berkeley School of Law, where she is director of policy initiatives at uh, the Samuelson Law Technology and Public Policy Clinic. She was appointed by California uh, Governor Gavin Newsom in March 20 of 21 to be the inaugural chair of the California Privacy Protection Agency Board. The California Privacy Protection Agency was created by the California Privacy Rights Act of 2020 and is charged with implementing and enforcing the California Consumer Privacy Act of 2018. Let's begin with Pam. Pam, can you give us some opening remarks? Yes, first, I am absolutely delighted to be here. And thank you to NAG and to the Vermont Attorney General for your kind invitation. Uh, Vermont has done so much for privacy, and I'm deeply honored to be here. I just have three brief points to make, which I'll elaborate on in our discussion. The first is that in order to really focus privacy legislation effectively, we need to be concrete and focus on practical solutions that actually address problems. And we need to ensure that our solutions are evidence-based, not just rhetoric. That's incredibly important today. And then secondly, we've got to pay attention to the context of the legislation. We need to make sure that that legislation is inclusive of all stakeholders, including people of color, including people who live under the threat of poverty or in poverty. And we need to make sure we're including other vulnerable groups, such as older Americans and others. So these are very important constructs. And then finally, we need to think about our resources. What resources do does government need to effectuate um, enforcement of the law? What resources do businesses need to comply with the law? And what resources do consumers need to be able to effectuate their rights under the law? In evidence-based uh, studies, we've seen that not all consumers can effectuate their rights easily. We need to take care of these issues. Thank you so much. Thank you. Can we get a microphone for Tom? Tom, some opening remarks. Is that uh, working great? Yes. Uh, as you can see by my lack of photo, I take my privacy very <laughs> seriously. <laughs> um, Someone take his picture and see if you can find it. Yeah, somewhere. exactly. Uh, first off, sincere thanks for the invitation to be here today. Uh, as was mentioned, uh, Digital Citizens has been working for about a decade trying to put a spotlight on online harms and risks, everything from the sale of illicit drugs to working with state AGs on the proper disposal of opioids, to um, how hackers bait and trick consumers into giving up their personal information, to the role of platforms, and unfortunately how some of them have been used to facilitate or enable, facilitate is too strong a word, to enable bad actors, both home and abroad, to disrupt American life. So I just want to make three quick points, and I know we're going to have a robust discussion. The first is there's a parable about the frog in the, in the boiling water. And that is, if you put a frog in boiling water, it'll immediately jump out. But if you put him in tepid water and slowly raise the temperature, it will be boiled to death because it didn't realize it was happening. I would argue over the last 20 years, as 
digital platforms and a digital world has been created, Americans have been the frogs, and that there wasn't a significant amount of forethought to what was happening. By the way, not just for Americans, but the companies themselves, which in oftentimes were overwhelmed by what was happening. Uh, these were largely engineering-driven companies uh, who were making decisions largely about whether something could be done as opposed to it should be. There wasn't a lot of sociologists in Silicon Valley, and I know that because I lived and worked in Silicon Valley for technology companies, and Tim knows this as well. So we haven't had that forethought. The third point I'd make is we need to bring consumers really deeply into this conversation because as frogs, they haven't had that chance for the last 20 years. And we need to make sure they are part of this conversation moving forward. And to that, I will offer you three quick numbers. The first is 55% say their privacy has been breached in the last couple years. It's a significant number. Second one is 29%, only 29%, say the fact that they largely get free access or services in exchange for their data is a good deal. 48% say it's a bad deal. Third, 64% say that they should be the owners of their digital data. And finally, fourth, 61% said they should be compensated for that data in some form or fashion. And I throw those numbers out because we're at a point in society where we have to decide, along with digital platforms, which I, you know, we're going to work obviously very closely with, to consumers and public officials to make sure we get this right. Because we have to get this right because this is our future. It is not going to change. Everyone in this room relies on digital platforms. And if we don't do a good job of making a better future, it's bad for everyone. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Well, I know everyone in this room refused to allow our democracy to die like that, and so we thank you for your comments. So, Tim, opening remarks? Yeah. General James, thank you so very much for the invitation and for leading this panel. Um, my apologies for not being with you. I have a young daughter uh, not yet able to be vaccinated, or else I would be with you all. Uh, I regret that I am not. Um, I have one of the few individuals who has the privilege every day, uh, not only this day, but every day for the last 20 years to work with both consumer and privacy advocates and with innovators each and every day. Very few people get to do both. Uh, and I'm here to uh, share with the, the generals and their staff that uh, there has been a false dichotomy set up, that we can either have innovation or privacy. Uh, you've been lied to. Um, these are false uh, narratives. Um, we have, because of this uh, set of false narratives, uh, had neither uh, privacy nor innovation. And uh, it is time, I hope, for us to raise our sights higher. Uh, and I think the, the generals can be a leading force to uh, drive a better discussion going forward. We can have better, truer privacy laws to protect the real uh, rights and the real privileges of Americans in many of the ways that Pam um, has begun to touch upon already this morning. And we can begin to force companies to provide innovation that actually provides real value uh, in the way that Tom was suggesting already uh, just a moment ago, consumers feel that it is lacking um, from what they've been provided here before. And so uh, I, I'll be happy to talk as we go forward in the panel about some ideas about how legislation can be written in better ways to drive that forward. I think we've had a market failure. I certainly believe we've had a regulatory failure because of that. Um, and I, I believe the generals can be and should be the force to drive forward to change the narrative going forward for consumers in America. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and lastly, Jennifer, opening remarks. Thank you, I, General James. Uh, it's wonderful to meet some of you, and Pam, it's wonderful to see you um, and to be here with all of you. Uh, I will first say, obviously, I am not Ashkan Sultani, and I apologize um, for that. We uh, at the California Privacy Protection Agency hired Ashkan to be our inaugural executive director. Uh, on Monday, the announcement went out, so I am filling in for him while he gets his feet. And I am really honored and delighted to be here. Secondly, um, because of my role as the chair of the board of the California Privacy Protection Agency, uh, and also as my, my role at University of California, Berkeley, I need to be clear that um, I will be speaking for myself and not for the agency, the board, my university, or any of my um, clinic clients. Um, and I know everyone in this audience understands that. 
Uh, I'd like to follow up on the other panelists a little bit um, in my with my opening thoughts. Um, one of the things that is most striking to me about the new California law that created the agency is that it came from the people. It is a prop. It was a proposition. It was a ballot initiative that was voted on by the people. And I think that this is really a reflection of the clamor for more control over their data and their destiny that Americans have had now um, growing uh, for at least the last 20 years. In my own research, um, I did, I did uh, research to look at um, Californians and Americans' privacy attitudes and desires, and they did not match up with business models in any way, shape, or form. Um, and we, I think, are really seeing that, um, that people are asking um, for, for better solutions. And I'm really glad to see that there is more focus on that at a policy level at this point. In terms of what we need, um, uh, I think other panelists have made um, uh, points that cover a lot of the, of the main things. But I want to emphasize uh, that uh, whatever we create needs to be usable for consumers. And it needs to reflect what is um, realistic, which means we need an understanding of technology, uh, which Ashkan brings. And it means that we need an understanding of people. And as Pam said, that means all people. That doesn't mean um, just the people um, who are looking at user um, experience and academic centers and in companies. Um, it means, uh, means people from all communities, uh, all, uh, all, all groups. Uh, and we really need to be thinking carefully about that, about equity and intersectionality. Uh, third, we need resources, which is a point that's already been made. We need to put substantial and um, uh, sufficient resources uh, into this problem. If you're thinking about what you might want to do in your state, um, that is an important question. And then finally, we need to avoid tunnel vision. Privacy does not exist in a vacuum. Privacy exists in a world that um, involves a marketplace, that involves people's lived lives, that involves the way that they interact with one another and with technology um, businesses um, across the board. So when we're thinking about privacy, we need to not forget about things like security. We need to not forget about things like automated decision making, because all of those things are interconnected and they all need to be taken into account. Again, I'm really delighted to be here and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much. So my first question to all of the panelists, Representative Welch just made a recommendation with respect to a digital authority. A digital authority to some extent would be responsible for rulemaking, some degree of, rec of regulation and recommendations to um, Congress. What are your thoughts? Anyone can take that question. I'm happy to jump in, although I, obviously I'm a little biased because okay. we just created a digital authority in California. Um, but I think this goes to um, uh, some of the discussion that we've already had in our introductory remarks, uh, which is uh, both resources um, and um, thinking holistically about the problem. Uh, so privacy has been sort of parceled off into different departments, into different laws for a very long time. Um, and privacy doesn't just involve that topic. It involves all kinds of digital issues. So um, thinking carefully about um, how that would be constructed, I think, is important. Um, but having um, having a, a sort of a dedicated digital authority, this is again my personal opinion, makes a lot of sense to me. And we do have models to look at. Um, uh, you know, California, you can watch us and you know learn from our mistakes and hopefully from our successes. Uh, obviously, there are data protection authorities in Europe um, that can give a lot of experience. Also um, in the Americas, um, there are examples that we can look to uh, in order to think about how to build this. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, I would just mention two things. One, um, I know part of this discussion is whether or not we have this patchwork of state laws or whether we have something that's more broad. Uh, having worked in companies, I know that having certainty really helps in terms of planning. So I think anything that covers a broader range and isn't patchwork is frankly better for consumers and I think it's better for society, it's better for companies because at least they have some certainty into what they're dealing with. So I think that's a fair request on their part or a fair expectation on their part that they're not going state by state or locality by locality. So the answer is yes, I think there is a value to that. 
but I think it has to be done in a very smart way. We know after 9-11 we created DHS, which we thought somehow was going to solve it all by putting it all together. Frankly, mixed results on that. So whatever we do, the answer is yes, but I think we have to be very smart and make sure it's targeted and doesn't try, doesn't become a bureaucratic morass in itself, which is not good for consumers, it's not good for the companies who are providing services, so ultimately it isn't good for society. I'll jump in. Um, thank you for the question. It's, it's, a, it's a very good question and an important question to really think through. There are now 146 jurisdictions in the world that have comprehensive uh, national level private privacy regulation of these, about 145 have very remarkably similar characteristics and policies. Among them is the creation of what's called the Data Protection Authority Office. So the Data Protection Authority offices throughout these jurisdictions are responsible for analog and digital privacy. It's super important that we understand that not all privacy is digital. We can't just focus on online privacy. The, the, eco, the data ecosystems of our world are not just digital. They are analog and digital and merged and all sorts of other things. When we go into a store and we, um, if we use a debit or credit card, um, we are purchasing something in person, but that information is also digital. So there is a real blending of these ecosystems in very complex ways. So I think we've got to really focus on the people and on the governance and on the enforcement and also auditing and making sure we're in a continual process of improvement. I think those really basic administrative tasks, looking at a larger picture um, is something that we need to be very careful to keep in focus. And I'm going to emphasize again that whatever is created, we must ensure that it is fully inclusive and that we are not creating an elite form of privacy for elites. We've got to think more broadly and we need to learn um, the lessons we've seen in the pandemic in particular and really open up the gates and really give people who have not had a voice, we need to give them a voice in these kinds of decisions. Thank you. Thank you. If I may uh, add to my pan the fellow panelists remarks, uh, there's an urgency that needs uh, action. I think we all feel it in the marketplace right now. Put me down as someone who has seen the AGs Act with great authority uh, and on a number of important cases over the last uh, two and a half decades in the privacy arena. You have written the body of law that we call privacy in the United States, largely through your uh, actions um, and enforcement actions. So for me, I, I would not want to eschew your valuable expertise. I'd rather see uh, greater resources, much greater resources brought to bear uh, to your offices immediately um, in the interim while we're considering whether or not uh, to have other data protection authorities set, set up in addition to um, or you know, in conjunction with your offices. But I would not want to see um, the common law authority that you've um, attained over, you know, literally 800 years of English um, legal um, tradition and the state statutory authority that you've obtained or your constitutional authority, which may allow you to take particular actions to protect consumers, um, be set aside while we're creating a separate uh, data protection authority in, your, in each of your states, um, because those powers are so important to allow you to enforce a particularly pernicious acts that may happen um, by um, bad acting companies or bad acting individuals in the privacy space. So if we can have an office that has your authorities and has your resources and then some, I'm all for it. If not, let's give your offices what you need so that you can go do the work that we need to do uh, on behalf of all consumers everywhere. Thank you. And we obviously would welcome more resources, all of the attorney generals um, who are here today and who are not would welcome that. But we do know that there is no comprehensive um, federal legislation uh, governing data privacy in the U United States. And as was mentioned, there's a patchwork of some states that have passed comprehensive privacy legislation. They include California, Virginia, Colorado, and Vermont. And if you, if you don't mind, I'm just gonna briefly go over the, that legislation. California has passed several privacy statutes. First, the California Consumer Privacy Act, which was passed in 2018, went into effect in 2020, and then the California Privacy Rights Act, which was passed as a ballot initiative 
in November 2020 and will go into effect in 2023. I'm sure Jennifer can tell us more about that. And it established um, the, the, uh, cons the California Consumer Privacy Act, established the right to know about personal information a business collects, the right to delete personal information, the right to opt out, the right to non-discrimination. Um, and uh, the ballot initiative basically strengthened um, the uh, California Consumer Privacy Act. Vermont in 2018 passed the nation's first law to regulate data brokers. What is a data broker, you ask? Well, I'm going to tell you. Data brokers are entities that knowingly collect or sell to third parties the personal information of consumers with whom they do not have a direct relationship. The Vermont law, which went into effect in 2019, requires data brokers to register annually with T.J. Donovan, the Ver Vermont OAG, and pay an annual 100 registration fee. Virginia. Virginia Consumer Data Protection Act was signed into law earlier this year and makes Virginia the second act, the, excuse me, the second state to enact a comprehensive privacy and data security law after California. It provides consumers with six main rights, the right to access, the right to correct, the right to delete, the right to data portability, the right to opt out, and the right to appeal. Colorado. Colorado is the third state to pass a comprehensive data and security law with the Colorado Privacy Act. Um, and it include, it gives Colorado, Colorado residents the following rights, the right to opt out, the right of ac access, the right to correction, the right to deletion, and the right to data portability. And as for my own state, New York, there's some legislation that has been introduced, but unfortunately has not passed um, uh, the Assembly and or the Senate. And so my question to the panelists, do you think um, the remaining states and territories should be adopting some variant of these laws, um, or should they do something entirely new? Um, what sort of alternative approach uh, would you consider and or recommend? Um, is there language or concepts that should be deleted? Um, or that should be included, or um, again, should we just pass uh, what the Congress member indicated, and that is a digital authority? I'm going to first begin uh, with Pam. Oh, thank you. Not a difficult question at all. <laughs> all right. Sorry. So <laughs> it's no problem. I'm going to to propose that. There is a very important role for the states. I know that many bemoan that the United States does not have comprehensive legislation, but there are folks who have been working in privacy for even longer than I have, and their consensus is that, you know, maybe there's a reason for that. Maybe there needs to be more time here in the U.S. for the consensus to truly emerge about what's right. Each state has a different context, and in privacy studies that we've done that are very, very data-focused, we've understood clearly that there are significant differences in privacy effectuation between urban and rural communities. So therefore, more rural states will have different needs and will need slightly tweaked regulations that will be more effective for them in, in ensuring that privacy can reach all the way through uh, from the, the the leaves of the, the tree all the way down to the, the deepest root. And I think that we've got to consider that. So I think that having said this, I like the idea of each state looking at its context doing its own analysis based on its stakeholders and really having a robust conversation, not of everyone in the United States, but of that region. Um, I'm based in Portland, Oregon, and here um, the Attorney General has been convening a what they call a central table task force. It's, conven it's uh, comprised of 10 um, individuals that are meant to represent um, you know, groups, broader stakeholder groups. I do sit on the central table and I represent consumers and uh, privacy interests along with other consumer and privacy groups in Oregon. But the thing is that's very unique about this is it's really, it's Oregonians and we're talking about what fits for Oregon. I think that if states are going to look at this, that's probably the most important thing that can be done is to really conduct local stakeholder um, meetings and inputs and really from from all stakeholders from business to consumers to various sectors health education etc we really need that and i think that there's a, a lot of room 
for a robust conversation to be had there. And I would love to see that as opposed to a replication of what has worked for other states, which may be much more populous or may have different characteristics, population characteristics and economic characteristics. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. So Oregon believes that one size should not fit all, um, led by their fabulous <coughs> Attorney General, Ella Rosenblum. What about the others? Patchwork or one authority? Yeah, I'll jump in. I prefer Brandeis and Laboratories of Democracy to patchwork. Um, and while I do think that um, having uh, some uh, consolidated expertise, as I mentioned earlier, can be beneficial, I agree with Pam 100% that states have their own context and what makes sense for um, individual states um, should at this point um, be paramount uh, for a few reasons. I mean, one, of course, is our Brandeisian tradition, but also the issues continue to evolve. They evolve quickly. Um, and so they combine with the different contexts of different states um, uh, in a way that I think makes it especially valuable um, for states to be thinking about what works for their own populations. That said, I do think that it's not as though it has to be um, uh, you know, a complete, you know, free for all with things being very different. Uh, as Pam said, naturally, the data protection authorities in Europe and the, and the laws um, that have developed there uh, tend to have uh, some commonalities that are very well conserved across jurisdictions. And in um, our own developing um, our own developing um, uh, set of options here in the United States, uh, a lot of those have been conserved. So the rights to correct, the rights to delete, the right to know, um, the right to understand what is happening with your data and to have some control over it. And having those kind of touch points uh, is something that I, using those kind of touch points is something that I think will naturally happen um, because states will be comparing uh, what's available um, to their context. Uh, and to and to um, how things are um, developing. Uh, I will say I think there are some emerging things that are particularly promising. Um, the first is not even emerging anymore. Um, thankfully, we seem to have had a decisive move away from list-based, personally identifiable information. It's really constrained definitions of what personal information is to more uh, flexible and dynamic definitions that actually represent um, how people interact um, with the world and how their data interacts uh, with the world. Uh, I, automated profiling and decision making is starting to be recognized as a key area, and I think that is a really important thing for states to continue to look at, as well as remembering the connection between privacy and security. And there are also more wonky sort of detailed things that I think are getting traction, and I think that that is valuable. Uh, for example, the concept of cross-context behavioral advertising, um, the concept of uh, businesses that a consumer intends to interact with, um, rather than, um, you know, if you just hover your mouse over something, that that indicates some sort of intent. I think these are concepts that are valuable um, and that uh, it's good that states are thinking about um, uh, sort of a set of norms. Um, but those, uh, those set of norms and um, common practices should always be filtered through the lens of what is appropriate for that state. Tim, I saw you shaking your head. <laughs> Uh, it, it was in, mostly in approval of Jennifer's remarks and those of Pam. Uh, there's a lot of commonality of opinion here. And so let me just maybe extend um, the remarks, if I may, of Jennifer and Pam, rather than disagreeing with them. Uh, to my mind, the best uh, privacy statute out there is the one that hasn't been enacted yet. I would point you to le legislation pending before the Massachusetts state legislature. It's S46. It's the Massachusetts Information Privacy Act. Uh, I would suggest to all of you that if you're going to model state legislation, this is the model that you, you want to work from. Uh, and let me tell you why. I think it's superior to what's been passed here before. And I commend um, this, those three states that have uh, taken the leadership role that they have and enacted those three comprehensive bills. They are a good start. Um, I, I hope we can do more. And I also want to point out that the Vermont Data Broker Bill is groundbreaking uh, as a transparency effort and it really pointing 
um, uh, shining a bright light on what I think is the most important privacy problem that doesn't get any attention, which is the data broker industry, which buys and sells the data of every single American all day, every day, and literally turns each and of a, each of us into a commodity without our ability to do anything about it. That That is the, the problem set that needs the most attention, but gets the least attention in the privacy world right now. Back to the Massachusetts bill for a moment, if I may. What I think is important about the Massachusetts bill and what makes it different from what's been passed here before is it sets up bright line rules. And it does it on important things. It sets up bright line rules that both work for innovators and for consumers by pointing out a series of thou shalt nots. It tells businesses you can't do the following things with data that you've gotten, however you've gotten them. And it does that at the most important moments in consumers' lives. It says you can't use data or misuse data with respect to people's education, their housing, uh, their, their credit, um, their jobs, um, their health, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The most important moments in their lives um, that we've identified, and, and Pam and I have worked on these questions for a number of years, trying to identify some of these critical moments. And, and so this bill has taken these and added to them and said, you know, you businesses, if you get this data, um, you can't use it to redline against people. You can't use it to discriminate against groups of people, either intentionally or accidentally. And so it, can, you know, it, it points out that algorithms, which are simply math, um, need to be foolproofed to make sure that they aren't used to either intentionally or accidentally um, discriminate against groups within society. And I think that kind of bright line guidance that takes off the table the worst things that can happen with data, the misuses, the accidental uses that can be truly harmful. I think that's the next and most important thing we can do to really protect consumers. Because from my vantage point as a, as a consumer advocate, as a lawyer, the bills that have been enacted so far into law give us rights to understand um, what data has been collected about us, to, to be able to access it, maybe to correct it, but they don't give us yet a way to stop the misuse of data that is happening right here, right now. That really can change and alter the direction of our lives. And so I'd point you all to that Massachusetts bill and say that really is where a, a lot of good work can be done. And it can be done in concert with the Vermont bill, which actually points out which data brokers are buying and selling the data to the businesses, which are then misusing or intentionally um, abusing the data of consumers. So Tim, you mentioned that you know, these private, these data privacy brokers, data brokers are part of the privacy ecosystem. So if states were to adopt the Vermont model, is there anything that you would add or uh, delete um, in, with respect to any legislation? Yeah, absolutely, and uh, thank you so much for the question. Um, and I'll, I certainly would love to hear my panelists, co-panelists' views on this. Uh, the, the registration statute is a good first step. It, it forces companies which have been in the shadows to come out uh, into the light. And what it does is it uh, makes them register with the state if they meet a series of criteria of being companies that are collecting data from consumers from all the moments in our lives, from what we uh, buy at various stores, um, from what we're, um, you know, subscriptions we're, we're using um, online, um, you know, people we're interacting with. Um, where we're getting uh, our, our data from, what you know, online interactions we're having. All of this data is being bought and sold by literally thousands of companies and then is being resold to every other company to market against us, um, frankly, to make decisions about us, about what goods and services were offered uh, and at what prices. And, and this kind of you know, price discrimination, um, decisions about housing, dis decisions about education, um, uh, decisions about health and education, um, these are being made without our consent, without our knowledge. And so to your question, General, what could be added to these registration statutes, the two that are out there, Vermont and California, which have led the way, are a series of these thou shalt nots that prevent these data brokers from selling data over a series of categories um, to a whole bunch of businesses. I, I, would, I would try to take out um, this model of commodifying um, Americans, um, especially the way that it happens in a third party way where businesses that none of us even know are collecting this data are selling data to other parties when we as consumers can never even control it. Tom talked at the beginning of his remarks about having 
um, consumers not feel like they have any ownership right of their data. The data broker industry is the entity that takes away that ownership right and then gives our rights to other um, businesses because our data, if it's being bought and sold without our consent, without our knowledge, um, without our input or, or control, um, really disempowers each and every one of us. So that's where I'd begin, General. Tom, what are your thoughts about Yeah, I'll, <clears throat> I'll be quick here. Mm -hmm. It, it seemed like the question was uh, fundamentally comes down to accountability, right. which is the reason you have registration so you can, they can be accountable. We have plenty of constructs where we have accountability both to a federal government, you know, a federal entity and to states for bad acts or behavior. So I don't see them as necessarily mutually exclusive. I think a lot of this plays out in the way we approach this. So I don't know that we have to make that choice necessarily. I don't think they're mutually exclusive. And, I'll leave it there. Any other panelists who want to comment? Oh, definitely. Okay. Um, <laughs> first, I want to commend, in particular, Vermont, because they did something amazing and brave and just really, they were the first state that passed the data broker anything. And I have to tell you, um, if I wake up and I'm having a difficult day, I still remember that and I'm pleased. <laughs> it was meaningful. I want to talk in very practical and concrete terms here. So first, there's a couple of things that Vermont did, other data broker um, statutes in other states have not done. Number one, their definitions of the Vermont definitions of data broker and other definitions were very sharp and clean. Other states have not followed through with this great clarity of definition, and it's caused a lot of I would call slippery issues um, in terms of who gets registered and what information is displayed and how. I think that could be improved. I like the Vermont model. Um, the second thing that Vermont did that was absolutely groundbreaking and no one, no one really knew it at the time. Um, my understanding is that someone in the AG's office added this um, as part of, uh, you know, thoughtfully um, as during the negotiations. And that is to um, require um, information about the knowing collection of the information of children. This is extraordinarily important to include in any data broker registration system, and I'll tell you why. So um, we monitor the Vermont data Bro broker registry very closely. This is why in January of 2020, we found an entry from a little company called Clearview AI, which willingly admitted that they were scraping the information of minors without consent. So this provided extremely important light um, to that activity. But there have been other entries which have been extraordinary and just a bit mind boggling. For example, um, a data broker, a very large national level data broker registered in Vermont and dug way down in their registration, one could find that they, they, they knowingly utilize the data of minors to create an inference score for parents. Yeah, that's not okay. So this is the use of, of course, AI and machine learning to create this type of scoring. We have an entire report about this called the scoring of America. This is a big deal. But I do think that Vermont could go another step in a very concrete, practical terms, let's explore an opt-out because now we know about what's being collected. Can we please be able to do something about it? I recognize that this would be a very big fight, but I do think that the definitional parameters of what Vermont has done is narrow enough to allow for this. And let me raise a very significant issue that we are researching right now, and that is this. During the pandemic, because of the length of time the pandemic has gone on, we have a public health uh, data set that is emerging into public view. Mm. As I think everyone in this room knows, HIPAA does not cover public health data. The state's uh, regulation covers public health data. Yeah. So we have a bit of a mess in that a lot of people are now having to have their um, private data, which is public health data, um, being circulated in all manner of vaccine credentialing systems and, and elsewhere as well. So we need to take a look at this. This is a very important um, data set and it's getting larger. And whether a person is vaccinated or not, it, it, that is not what I'm 
bringing into question here. What I'm bringing into question is the emergence of huge and unprecedented amounts and volumes of public health data of individuals moving into the wild. What do we do with this? Because we're already seeing the, the data in aggregate, mind you, in aggregate, not microdata um, or personally identifiable data, but in aggregate is being um, utilized for public health purposes, but also now for other purposes as well. So um, I think this is something that we're going to be grappling with for a long time, but it needs attention. Thank you. Pam, that raises another issue yeah. for another um, segment, but we really need to talk about um, those data sets. That's very troubling, yeah. and the fact that that might be out in the ecosystem. Um, but you did bring up um, really an important issue, and that is um, allowing consumers to opt out. Um, and basically, businesses should be, should be required to uh, uh, obtain an affirmative opt-in before collecting data. And another hot topic issue, and that is um, the right to a private action, a private right of action. What are your thoughts? Let's begin with Tom. Sure. So we are at the heart of the business model of digital platforms with this question. I, I actually wrote it down in advance because I wanted to think about it. So users plus traffic equals data, data equals monetization, monetization equals revenue, revenue equals a stock price, and a stock price offers the ability to attract talent and acquire companies. And fundamentally, I'm leaving some stuff out there to, for simplicity, that is the business model where if you don't pay for your, if you don't pay for a service, you know, there's an old adage, if you don't pay for a product, you are the product. Mm -hmm. That is fundamentally a business model right there. And so in an opt-out situation, you, we are disrupting that business model. Doesn't mean we should do it, but we're going to a fundamental issue there. So. I look at that and say, this is what we need to get to when I say, as consumers and authorities such as yourself and the companies that, who are part of this, we need to get to this question of business model, what it means for consumers, what are the implications for these companies. If there's an opt-out, it will disrupt this business model. That's not a bad thing. I actually probably support it. But that's what we're getting at here. This is a really significant question that we have to answer moving forward. So um, California, Virginia, Vermont, and Colorado, they all have opt-out um, uh, versions in their legislation. Jennifer, do you want to speak to that issue? Should more states have opt-out? And I know no one wants to mention it. What about a private right to action? Yep. Thanks, those are both really hot topics. Um, and I'll actually start with uh, what Pam mentioned about the data broker registry. Um, uh, Vermont really is the leading light here. Um, the California did amend the CCPA in 2019 to add a data broker registry. Um, it's run by the California Attorney General and um, it does include a right to opt out. So you can look at the disclosures and um, each disclosure explains how um, a consumer can opt out. There are things that Vermont has that I personally, again, speaking for myself, wish we had um, disclosures about children, collecting data from children, as Pam mentioned, also disclosures about data breaches. But the question of the opt out, which is not just the data broker question, but the broader question um, that General James brought up, there, there, the, one of the most important things I think for everyone to think about is what do you mean by opt out and how or opt in, but if we're, but the model has so far has been opt out, what do you mean by opt out? What is the mechanism by which people can opt out? Uh, opting out has to be realistic um, for both uh, consumers and for companies in order for it to work. So in California, we have two things um, and we can see how they develop. One is that people can designate others to opt out for them. So, and that could either be a company or, or it could be NGOs and both NGOs and companies have um, stepped up to provide this service. Secondly, um, uh, California uh, has what uh, 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 sort of a global opt out um, which isn't going to work in the offline world, but in the online world, um, the it, 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 it you uh, the excuse me um, the um, the attorney general's initial regulations refer to it as global privacy control. The CPRA refers it to an opt out preference, but it's an automated way for consumers to express their rights um, and for businesses to respond automatically. And this is something um, that uh, that uh, um, policymakers could look at. 
carefully as well in order to create an opt-out regime uh, that provides some certainty for businesses and also provides a realistic uh, way for consumers to express their rights. Pam or Tim, anyone want to weigh in? I'll jump in to the blazing fire of the private right of action uh, issue. I, I love a good discussion, and this is just about as good as it gets. So the position of the World Privacy Forum is we do not take a position on private right of action. And please let me explain why. Private right of action has been a sword that all parties in the privacy debate that are typically present fall on and die on. It has stopped meaningful dialogue about other aspects of privacy. So I, I believe um, that private right of action should be left to the states and to their practices. And most states have a very um, significant uh, set of legislation, which will either include or exclude, or they'll have their own policies. So that's, that's where I sit with that. Having said that, I think there's something very important here. You know, um, in the privacy world, there's, there's a certain subtle lack of maturity in working with people. It's and working with people that disagree with the positions we may have. It's really important to take a cue from the environmental movement, which is older than the privacy movement, and to understand that the way we can make progress is through cooperative dialogue. We need to be able to listen to other people and to other stakeholders and their points of view and and the private right of action is the same. There are many nuances in how a private right of action can be effectuated. So instead of simply falling on a yes or no sword question, um, yes, PRA, no PRA, death, <laughs> I think we, we would really gain a lot if we learn how to trust each other more, work together better across all the sectors and stakeholders, all of them, and learn to have a more inclusive dialogue and a more... Um, uh, compassionate dialogue, and I mean that we, we need to be able to regard the views of others without instantly um, putting up our shields and instantly blocking those views. And I think if we can learn how to communicate better, and not to sound, you know, airy-fairy, but this is just strictly um, how more mature sectors are, are doing business. If you look at environmental regulation, you see that very, very challenging questions, such as the PRA, have been acknowledged and discussed in a collaborative um, uh, way uh, while still understanding that there are differences. I think we've got to get there. And I think a good first step is to simply be able to have discussions without falling on our swords. Thank you. But if, if I may, the abuse or misuse of data to engage in deeply discriminatory practices against individuals and groups within society, protect, particularly protect, protected groups within society, which are not protected because of the abuses uh, of data, uh, is so significant right now and so um, unaddressed that we do need um, to bring greater attention to that. And so put me down as somebody who is open to the idea of a private right of action, which is reserved specifically for these kinds of redlining actions, these abuses of um, uh, discriminatory actions, which otherwise would go unaddressed. Um, until and unless the AGs are fully resourced, until and unless the FTC is fully resourced to address these particular questions, uh, I would see a, a private right of action as something that could be really meaningful. Now, what I would not do is do what I think most businesses are really deeply afraid of, which is give a, a wide open private right of action for every ticky tack foul uh, out there um, for for businesses. And I think that that could be really harmful. It would you know really draw attention away from the most meaningful harms that are not being addressed. And so I would really truly carefully craft a private right of action to address these moments in our, our lives, in groups um, in, of individuals' lives, that where, where data is used to alter the course or direction of people's um, financial um, moments in their lives, their, 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 their families' histories. And, and if we're if we're careful, we draw that kind of statute, I think a private right of action could be very helpful, again, until we've properly resourced uh, your offices. So Jennifer, let's go, let's step into the fire a little uh, more. Um, so in addition to just breaches, just as giving consumers a property right um, in their data, 
Would that be technically workable? What do you say to that? Yeah, here I'll have to lean on my academic background. Um, this is definitely not even just anything to do with California policy directly. Um, I th this is this is this is an. This has come up many times in my um, in my academic career, all the way back when I was in law school, at least 20 years, probably longer. Periodically, um, uh, someone will say, hey, why don't we have a property right in data? It is a beguiling idea. We like property in the United States. It is an obvious um, uh, sort of, it, uh, it signifies a locus of control. Um, and it, uh, it appears uh, to, uh, perhaps provide some way for individuals to recoup the uh, profits that are being made um, off of off of data about them. Uh, I have put into the CLE materials an article by my colleague Pam Samuelson from 2000 um, entitled um, uh, "Privacy as Intellectual Property?" Question uh, mark, which, in her way, Professor Samuelson worked out all of the issues. Uh, before most people thought of them. Uh, and the, my fund of, again, this is my academic opinion, my fundamental thought about this is that it is beguiling, um, but it is fundamentally unworkable um, for a few reasons. The main two being uh, data doesn't always uh, neatly um, connect to just one person. Um, uh, DNA, for example, connects families, um, and it's very hard to kind of think through how that might or should work. That's a practical intellectual property nerd sort of question in some way. The, uh, the sort of sharper issue, um, which is count can be counterintuitive, is that property equals alienation. Uh, if there is a property right in data, then that property right can be transferred. And we know from the way that um, click wrap agreements work and uh, the way that uh, decisions are sort of presented to individuals and how they react to them, uh, that uh, it might be very likely for people to actually alienate that property right in their data and no longer have it. Um, so for that reason, I do think that it's, uh, it's really not a practical solution. Others have different views, but but that's my view. On the private right of action, California has a private right of action. Um, it is limited to uh, data breaches above a certain threshold. And uh, what I would say is uh, I would encourage um, people to, uh, as Pam said, to think through the purposes of, of a private right of action and how it might need to be targeted. Tim gave some thoughts about how he thought it would be targeted. And what is the sort of the best basket of things for the attorney general um, to enforce and whether there is a basket of things that it would make sense for individuals to enforce. And again, that's my very personal thought um, and just a little bit of uh, information about what California does. I'd like to add on to, to Jennifer's um, comments because our, our views are quite similar on on uh, data property rights. So I'm just going to put forward a couple of data points here. And the first data point is um, it's really not a practical um, issue because of the extraordinary complexity and interconnectedness of data ecosystems now. Most data ecosystems today are in either real time or near real time, some of the major ones. Um, and they also cross borders as they're doing all of this into other jurisdictions which have other laws which would um, control this data. And I would point out, for example, the FINRA system, which is a financial sector system which crosses borders. It's a system uh, run by essentially a regulated NGO. It's an um, SEC system, but run by an NGO. And FINRA is extraordinary um, because you, you're dealing with more than 1 billion data points per day, and it's all for enforcement of SEC rules. And um, what FINRA has had to do is they've had to move to a very complex AI machine learning system to be able to parse all of the reports that they're getting. And this is not the only um, real-time data system. If you think of CDC and the World Health Organization and the European um, equivalent of CDC and the African and Indian equivalents, you have to realize that all of this data is rummaging and rolling and being utilized through these systems. And it happens as quickly as that. So um, because of that, a property right of data becomes 
an enormously challenging right to effectuate and is probably very unlikely um, to be practical. Thank you. Thank you. Tim, you mentioned that the FTC was under-resourced. Um, if the FTC were properly funded, would that be the agency, the singular agency that would be responsible, uh, that could be responsible, obviously, for protecting our, our privacy? I, th I think at last count, General, uh, by my count, as somebody who's practiced before the FTC for many years, I think that uh, the FTC is currently enforcing 65 odd statutes, uh, and of which there's a few privacy uh, statutes built into there. But I, I don't think it's possible that the FTC alone could be the single cop on the beat, if you will. Uh, we need you and each of your colleagues. Uh, to have fully funded offices. I think I've, I've hit this uh, drum uh, many times. I'm going to keep hitting it. Uh, you need more resources. I hope your state legislatures are listening. I hope they, they fund you fully because I think it needs to be a companionship where you are working hand in glove. There are going to be things that are going to happen in your uh, states and municipalities within your states where you're going to be the first entity that sees what's happening and the FTC is fully occupied. I think the FTC um, is, is currently... Um, reviewing something like 200 consent decrees in the privacy space and and just their management of those consent decrees some of which are most of the which are now on a 20-year time horizon absorbs virtually all the staff time that's available uh, so just managing the the existing consent decrees from settlements that have been reached on privacy issues is absorbing the entire staff time so we could you know quintuple the 40 person staff approximately 40 person staff and we would not be close to be able to begin i think to um, give the ftc what it needs to begin to bring new and meaningful cases so no i'm sorry we can't can't get there um, just with the FTC, from my perspective yeah i i go back to something you started this conversation with about our laws have not kept up and it's not just our laws but it's our organizations thinking about what tim said and then jennifer said about um, uh, whether or not we can, it's practical for, to have a, a, a right to this data. Tim's point is we are not yet at a point where we have organizations that are, in pl that we are, that are resourced to do this. And from a practical standpoint, we're not at a standpoint yet where data can be collected that. If you look at the music industry, when someone sings a song, there's an engineer and there's labels and there's background singers and there's musicians. And the process of making sure that that right is actually monetized and allocated the right way is really difficult in 2021. So is it practical in 2021? Probably not. Will it be practical in 2030 and 2040 when our data, our ability to manage data might be different? That might be different, you know, might change. So right now there's a question of practicality because we're not modernized, we're, our, our, our systems are not modernized enough to be able to do what Jennifer, the, the issues Jennifer raised. And Tim's point is we don't have an FTC that's actually able to be effective in the ways we're talking about in 2021 for, a, for the 21st century. So I don't think they're actually different right. in that we, that what you started with is we are not prepared for this world right now. But many have, and this is my last point before we open it up to the AGs and to everyone in the audience, many have argued that the Fair Credit Reporting Act contains all of the protections um, and rights and procedures that a privacy law could require. It also has the benefit of being a law that we've had for over 40 years to work <laughs> with and to develop jurisdiction around. So what do you think of using uh, the Fair Credit Reporting Act as a basis for a comprehensive uh, privacy law, um, especially expanding the scope to cover all data, not just credit reporting data? If anyone wants to take that on before we um, ask our AGs if they have any questions, uh, please. I'll take that on. Okay. Thank you so much. It's a great question. I love the Fair Credit Reporting Act. It's a fabulous uh, piece of legislation. What a lot of people don't know is that when the, the Senate Banking Committee um, started to draft that, they called in all the stakeholders, they called in all the credit bureaus, they called in all the financial sector regulators, they called in people who'd been harmed. They had an extraordinarily noisy and difficult conversation. You can find it all in the congressional, um, uh, the, the, the rooms of congressional history on that statute. It's an extraordinary piece of legislation. What makes it extraordinary is its balance. It, it effectuates rights for consumers and ensures that they can get them effectuated. However, the Fair Credit Reporting Act does have some gray areas, and I do think there is a good place to expand those areas. Tim has 
basically been talking about eligibility today. Eligibility situations such as acceptance to educational institutions, um, other eligibility situations such as getting a job, et cetera. The Fair Credit Reporting Act doesn't cover all modern eligibility situations, and that could be expanded. I don't know if it would do everything, but it's definitely worth looking at as a model. Thank you. Any questions from our attorney generals or their representatives? Any questions from the general audience? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, you spoke early on in the panel about uh, data protection agency. Um, any sort of agency like that would need experts who understand those issues and like technology and everything. Um, how do we ensure that such an agency would remain independent um, of influence from its regulated entities while still ensuring its officials and staff have the knowledge and tools required to perform the day-to-day -day regulatory work? Anyone want to take that on? Well, I can say how California's is set up um, in case that is helpful. Uh, so the, it's the, it was the proposition that created um, our agency. Um, our agency will ultimately share enforcement authority with the California AG. Um, the California AG will be responsible for civil enforcement and we will be responsible for administrative enforcement. So uh, there is a, a chunk of enforcement, a very important part of enforcement that remains with the AG, which has its own constitutional protections. Uh, for the agency itself, um, there are in the law uh, requirements for, uh, first of all, the agency is independent or quasi-independent. It, uh, it is not uh, uh, under the um, a control of, of, of the other branches of government, although they do appoint the board. Uh, the requirements in the law are for the board to be uh, scrupulously independent, to take no direction from anyone else. Um, and then there are time limitations um, after leaving the board uh, during which um, somebody would be able to uh, come back and, um, and influence or work on a case that is before the board. Uh, there's a one-year limit um, for work and then there's a two-year limit um, for advocacy and then of course regular conflicts uh, limitations would apply. We're in the middle of preparing our incompatibility, incompatible activities um, uh, policy, which in, uh, relates to um, the kinds of things that employees can do. Uh, so that, you know, we can talk through and you can think about whether you think that that is sufficient, um, but that is the sort of the model that California is set up under. There is a challenge with um, and it's always a challenge, isn't it, um, for all of us uh, with being able to attract talent given the pay that we can offer um, compared to the pay that others can offer. And that is a practical you know, question, um, but so far um, we've been, I feel really delighted and successful that we managed to hire Ashkan Sultani, uh, and then we'll, then we'll see how it goes. So thank you for that question. It was a great discussion. Let's give our panelists uh, a round of applause. Um, and let me conclude by saying it's been up to government to safeguard privacy since the days when privacy uh, involved. Um, and it's really critically important that we all play a role and that we all work together to find a way to stay connected and protected. Thank you all.